Okay, welcome back everyone. Let's get started with our post-lunch sessions. Deepest thanks to our gold sponsors, Cajon Valley Union School District and Officiant Academy, Inc., and silver sponsor, Mosaic Learning, for making this event possible. We appreciate your constant support. Now coming up next is a panel discussion on the topic, Improving Teacher Motivation and Retention. Without any delay, let's call Dr. Sonia Toledo, Joshua Finkel, Robert Landau, Panarat Rolander, and Tracy Brown. Please welcome them with a round of applause. Awesome, thank you everyone for having me. Am I, I'm good? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So we are here with a, a group of experts that not only um, focus on K-12, but also higher education. My name is Dr. Sonia Toledo, and I'm the founder and CEO of Dignity of Children. And I want to have my panelists introduce themselves. You can start. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> and I'm here now. Uh, my name is Tracy Brown. I'm a United States Coast Guard veteran, and I am here representing Polk Institute Foundation. Uh, we are a higher learning. We have a 40-week program where we teach people uh, how to be in entrepreneurs. It's pretty amazing. Uh, I'm a number one best-selling author and a speaker on mindset. So I, I'm the facilitator at Polk, and I teach mental fitness for entrepreneurs. Hi, um, I'm Panarat Rolader. I am an adjunct MBA faculty at uh, Washington Adventist University. My expertise is about managing human capital. Um, we focus on HR function within organizations. Um, in addition, I also uh, teach uh, the other classes of business, such as marketing, uh, strategy, uh, leadership, uh, thank you for having me here. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. I'm Robert Landau, and I spent over 45 years working in six different countries in the international school world and moved to Hawaii in 2015. And I'm currently uh, have my own consulting company and specializing in actually coaching teachers and administrators to go to education 2.0 and beyond. And it's a pleasure being here. Hey everybody, I'm Joshua Finkel, and uh, I run the Creative Combustion Acting Studio in Los Angeles, and I'm also a senior adjunct professor of theater and dance at California Lutheran University in Thousand Oaks, California. I also have uh, 12 different master classes that I uh, circulate around the country to help uh, various theater groups, as well as professionals, public speakers of all ages and levels, helping their public speaking, help them find relaxation and their presence, and really become empowered and powerful when they present. Yes, thank you. So I'm really excited to have an, um, a conversation about how do we motivate and empower teachers to stay in the field and improve their own work and, of course, help our young people thrive. But first, let's talk about some issues. Now, you know, when you look at this, this is basically saying, wait a minute, teachers are feeling burnt out, teachers are feeling like they don't have the support, teachers are feeling like, you know, when we came back to COVID, there is like a pushback. But out of everybody who's been surveyed from this National Education Association is basically saying, I'm tired. Why are teachers tired? Um, and we have to ask this question. Why? What is going on that more than 70% of our teachers, two-thirds of our teachers are saying they're tired? Are you? How about now? <laughs> so let's look at this. Teacher shortage. So because of the teacher shortage, the teachers that are coming to the program to, to work, have to do extra work. Burned out. There's a clear issue that not only were they burned out after COVID, they were burned out during COVID, and they were burned out before COVID because of the, the, the intensity of testing, record keeping, evaluation, and meeting um, their quotas helps the burned out. Um, where do we get a chance to think about what teachers need? And then tech fatigue. 
tech fatigue is something that not only has happened um, during COVID, but after, what is the balance when it comes down to technology and having people understand that technology is an actual tool for teaching, not the only um, result for teaching? And then what are the personal goals of the mission and the institution? Um, when we look at the matching of the teachers and the institution, we basically are not connecting those two together to know that we are um, bringing people in that are in alignment with our mission. But what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna have the panelists take an opportunity to tell, to tell you why they're here on, on this topic. Oh, sorry, let's go back, go. I'm, I'm kind of, the last thing that we talked, that she mentioned was personal goals and missions of the Institute. I come from, I'm, I'm kind of an outlier. I come from the outside looking into education. I'm with Polk Institute and they do things very differently because they're not locked into the box of the bureaucracy that's going on. And it's all about personal goals. I teach mental health or mental fitness. Mental fitness starts with understanding who we are, what we want, self-assessment, understanding what it is that I'm looking for and understanding my path. So if I understand who I am, what I want, because want being the precursor to all decisions, what do I want and what am I willing to do to get there? And once I understand that, I can go to the institutes and match with them, whether it be uh, academia or whether it be outside of that box. Where do I fit? But it, comes, it starts here. Uh, one of my favorites, Tony Robbins, we were talking about this. And 80% of what we're being taught in any specific uh, area is systems and strategies. But 80% of the game is going on inside your head. 80% of the game is how do you look at those things? How do you look at systems? How do you look at this? And so I'm, I come from the point of view of if I understand and I'm very clear on what it is that I want, I'm going to understand what I need to do to get there. And then if somebody comes to me, I'm not gonna be distracted. I can say, that's a great idea. It's just not my path. And once I can do that, then I can just move forward and move forward and move forward. And when we know that, we can match up with the institutes. Yeah, so you're pretty much um, focusing on the mindset. That, mindset. Well, we had a conversation about fixed mindset and growth mindset. Right. So how do you create growth mindset in a fixed institution? Right. I'm ready to hear that later. Um, to me, uh, I would say that I like to take a look at organizational level because to make organization to be successful, we really have to take a look at our employee. So there are many issues that's going on to make people work well. And there are things that we need to uh, improve since it's not helpful, such as uh, uh, the, the burnout issue, which is a part of mental health. And also, um, we need to take a look at the support from the organization, like how organization would provide better support to their employees. I think the, at the end is about how we're gonna make them have a high performance. So that would be the outcome. Thank you. Okay, I have three minutes to talk about things that work, not the problem at hand. Number one, uh, while at Singapore American School, we decided to change our teacher evaluation system to a teacher growth, personal and professional growth system and designed a, a process that honored the work that teachers were doing based on standards and forced our administrators to do continual walkthroughs and promised teachers that they would be in their classrooms and we promised feedback in less than 48 hours based on concrete observations in four areas. That's number one that worked. Every one of our teachers said it's about time we looked at our growth and not felt every time you walked in the room we were evaluated. Number two that works with teachers is not to teach them. We need to change our professional development model from teaching to coaching. And that's what I do personally. I coach teachers. I don't tell them what to do, I coach them, just like a great sports coach does. You give the skills, you watch them, you give them feedback, and they improve their practice. Number three, based on what Sonia said, 
I'm convinced now that teachers in an Education 2.0 environment are having struggles with their mindset, but it's not just their mindset, it's their strengths. In order to do Education 2.0, you have to be relational, you have to be strategic, and you have to be influential. A lot of our teachers are executors. They want to do the same thing every day in the same way. They need to have the strengths that are gonna get them to turn the education over to our kids. I wanna piggyback off that. I think that's a great idea. <clears throat> um, excuse me. Um, I would say, in my institution at California Lutheran University, um, there is a st like learning outcomes that one of the courses I teach is beginning acting to non-majors, to non-actors, to all sorts of different kinds of students. Some of them may have interest in acting and eventually join the department, but these are folks that sometimes are here to check a couple of boxes off and I can fulfill this public speaking requirement as well as fulfill another requirement. But what they walk away with is a complete different gestalt of how to memorize, how to be in the world, how to relax, how to be a better public speaker, how to gain confidence. So some of these things are learning outcomes that all the different faculty are required to meet, but their curriculum of their beginning acting class is completely individual compared to mine as long as all meet at the end. So I would say <clears throat> it's about thinking out of the box to help with the fatigue. Um, I was also sharing at lunch, uh, a, a course I teach is stage speech. I teach it once every two years, one day a week for an hour and 40 minutes, one semester. It's about 13, 14 classes, maybe 20 something hours. Now I have my master's degree in classical theater. I would love to give them an avalanche of information. <clears throat> and I have been trying to do that over the years, but I find it's too much in the short amount of time I have. So I'm about to teach that course again, and I'm always reinventing, reinventing the curriculum. Think outside the box and say, what can I accomplish? How are these students currently listening to information? How are they absorbing information? <clears throat> There's no attention span anymore, yeah. none. We are all bombarded by quick cuts, TikTok, 15 second strumming through. You have about five seconds now before we stay on that channel or we tune out. So if you really come in and headline, you really come in with, here's what we're gonna to learn today and here's how we're gonna do it and let's make it fun in a quick, sort of boiled down way. I think that's going to appeal to how they listen and the absorption factor I find is completely different. So I think you're talking about reinventing how do you teach I have to teach the same curriculum every time, but how I teach it is depending upon what's trending, how kids are listening, and how they're absorbing. Yes. And I just reshape how I teach the subject matter, and I have found that incredibly successful. And because in some of the stuff I do, for example, with, with acting technique, it's always something different coming toward me. It's not, it's always the same way. People don't know how to do calculus yet. Some people can, some people can't. But how I address that particular person is really me putting my attention on them and saying, let's find a way to have you improve your voice and find range that this person would be given a different exercise. So thinking about connecting with your students in 50 one-on-one -on -one meetings every class rather than spraying it to, I'm talking to a group and I hope some of you get it. Yeah. If you kind of get in there and really look at that person and keep finding the sense of play, I think for me that invention makes me less fatigued yes. and um, keeps me challenged, you know, and it kind of reshapes, and according to what's trending, like who are the hottest, you know, I will bring up videos and say, now what did you feel about that person's diction? And they're watching a great, you know, MTV video of one of their favorite artists. So what did Josh, you, do? you have definitely pointed on something that is really critical, which is um, we want, we're teaching children what to think, and we want to teach them how to think. But we can't have teachers teach how to think if we don't allow them to think. So I want to really start with um, some questions, right? So I want you as um, experts here to say, if we have a teacher shortage now, 
how do we even tackle this problem? How do we tackle the problem of getting new teachers, keeping the teachers, retaining the teachers that we have? So who would like to start that conversation? I'll, I'll be happy to jump in on that one. For me, it's, if you think about education is probably one of the few industries that doesn't even think about marketing. If you're thinking about selling a product, mm -hmm. right? The first thing you want to do is make that product fun, sexy, whatever it is. And, you know, somebody had mentioned, I believe it was yesterday, they were talking about they're giving this, this, oh, this is what education is, this is what it's like to be a teacher, and then they get in the classroom and it's a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you're selling a, an odd bill of goods here. And so if, if education were to look at a marketing strategy, and not just based on false promises, but actually creating a space where people get to use their gifts because people do not burn out when they're doing something they love. And they're given, they're allowed a space in order to exercise their gifts. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm a firm believer, if you love what you do, you will never work a day in your life. Yes. And if you give teachers an opportunity to move in their motivational gifts, the reason, the hope, and the goals, and the joy of why they even wanted to go into education, and you allow them a space in order to operate in that, here's, here's what the kids need to learn. Figure out how, they, how they're going to do this in the way that you do that. You're going to eliminate burnout, yeah. but you're going to attract. You go back to getting more staff. You're going to attract people that go, you know what? That looks like fun. Yes. I would love to do that. And you give them, yeah, because people can't create in a box. Yeah. Humans are not meant to be in a box. There is no box. How many people said, oh, get out of the box? Well, there is no box. Yeah. Well, there is no box, but we're putting educators in a box and saying, now go and be creative. So doesn't happen. We want to give teachers the opportunity to be creative. Yes. And not only that, put their own stuff into the game. Yes. Like, I have something to offer, and I know how to teach these kids to get to the results. Like, yes. I feel like we need to trust teachers Give them a voice. Give them a voice. Let them be a part of the process of building their curriculum. Yes. Give them a, a voice in that. And I think that would be a huge bump. I, I mean, I'd go, yeah, yeah. I'm in. Robert. What yeah, I'm just going to riff off what Tracy said. Uh, one of the best known films, again, speaking to Education 2.0, is Most Likely to Succeed. That film was exclusively uh, filmed at High Tech High in San Diego, which now has 14 campuses, charter school system. And guess what they did? They opened their own graduate school of education, one of the first non-college-based teacher education programs. And they've made teaching really look attractive. Because if you know about High Tech High, it's completely project-based. And now they're training teachers. These are some of the most sought-after teachers in the country. And I think we've got to break away from the traditional teacher education preparation program, which certainly didn't prepare me for teaching, and start moving towards teacher preparation that are preparing teachers for schools like High Tech High. Again, let's remind ourselves, we are here for education 2.0, not education 19th century. Nice, nice. So I have another question for you. Okay, so how can, now burnout is clear, and I think, you know, Tracy, you nailed it. If you have a purpose, you get up in the morning and you're looking forward to that day. You don't want to snooze. You don't want to <laughs> snooze. <laughs> but I love your entrepreneurial style of marketing because you, with entrepreneurship skills, you actually get up thinking, I need to solve this today, right? But if somebody else is solving it for me, and telling me what to do, it's very difficult to feel like I have control. So what, how could leadership create a culture to keep teachers motivated and retain them? Um, go. Um, okay, I think um, I would like to share my thought about um, Closer. Equation. Okay, um, well, first of all, I have to say that I'm so excited. <laughs> Okay, um, when we think about the system at organizational level, there are a lot to do, and that's the job of leadership, okay? So first of all, we need to start at the leader level, I mean senior executive level, such as um, the president of university, the principal of 
the school. First of all, they need to be a strategic leader. It means that they need to understand the business. They need to know what their organization is trying to do. And they need to understand that the one that really the key of their business is their employees. Mm -hmm. And as a teacher, why? Because education organization is about providing the service in terms of uh, teaching and learning, right? So the one that would educate uh, the students is a teacher. So the teachers or instructor, they are very, very important for this business. So they, the leader, when they understand about this, they have to be able to lead everyone and achieve organizational goal together. Mm -hmm. So to do that, they have to make sure that all the teacher is also strategic leader. They have to know their role. They have to know what they are trying to do. But now, back to something that's very simple. People are people, just like all of us. Every day we feel different. In the morning, we might feel different uh, from the afternoon. So we are have emotion, and it's changing all the time. So how are we going to make our teacher feel like they need to do a good job in terms of develop people, in terms mm -hmm. of educated, uh, educate their students? So the key is about motivation. So I would like to point out something that's really important uh, about motivation. And I believe that many of us here probably heard about it before. It's called uh, motivation theory. It's a um, Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? Mm -hmm. Which is start from basic needs and yes. keep going up into self-actualization. Teacher are uh, people like us. Yes. So we need to, uh, the leader of organization, first of all, need to understand the nature of human and now try to make them um, do a good job and have a high, job, uh, high, high performance. So they need to work on teacher motivation. For Individually. Example, yes, yes. So I would like to say something really quick now. I know that we, we don't have much time. So first of all, they need to do the research. So they have to gather all information about individual needs. Everyone has different needs. If we don't have the need, then we don't go to work, right? Why not just stay home watching TV? They might have to take care of the bill for their household. They might have to take care of their older parents or their children. So everyone has the needs, depends on their age, uh, even gender. So we need those information, and then we approach each of them. Yes. Some teachers may not have the car to drive. How about school offer something like a carpool? So it's, it's really fun. This topic is real fun. Uh, it's yeah. really fun, actually. So I would say that, first of all, focus on the leader of organization. Make sure that they are business savvy. Mm -hmm. In this case, they are business savvy about running education organizations. Yes. Thank you so much. You remind me of creating a learning organization, the arts and practice of a learning organization by Peter Sege. It's like we learn by knowing each other's mental model. We learn by knowing who we are and creating and, and teaching each other together these two hours. Why? Because she visited every single teacher every single morning, create a culture to keep teachers motivated. I had an elementary principal who told me I can't meet any morning for these two hours. Why? Because she visited every single teacher every single morning, five days a week. Mm -hmm. That motivated her teachers. Yeah. How many administrators do that? So that would be a clear solution to how to motivate teachers. So connection. Yeah, and you had mentioned this earlier, Robert, when we were walking back. It's like, it's taking the time to not evaluate. If, if, you, if you've got an administrator coming into your classroom, the first thing you think is, great, what am I gonna do wrong? 
Mm -hmm. right? You're thinking you're going to be evaluated when in fact they should be there. It's like what I tell CEOs. CEO stands for Chief Encouragement Officer. You should be the empowerment officer, the encouraging officer. Well, that's what your administrator should be. They should be there saying in the classroom, seeing what the needs are and how can I help you meet those needs. Awesome, awesome. Let's go on to another question. This is getting hot. <laughs> Tech fatigue. How do we support teachers' development and growth and when they feel teachers? you know, tech fatigue. You wanna go? So, yes. Um, a lot of my business, uh, which is uh, coaching actors and public speakers, um, has moved online. In fact, mm -hmm. in the show business arena, uh, the whole, so many casting offices have closed down, so many businesses have closed down to save money on, we can do it online, we don't need to rent this. We can come into a conference room once a week and the rest can be online. Save some money, which is great. Um, but obviously, like I, I, in teaching some classes online, I found that I, again, shifted the model. There were some, I changed the syllabus so that uh, it varied between group classes and a class later that week was broken down into individual coachings. So if people felt like they weren't like just sitting around going, I'm on my phone, I'm just waiting, you know, I'm zoned out. Instead, they really felt like they had this incredible one-on-one -on -one session with me for part of the week where they really addressed their issues, their problems, I could really hear their needs, and I could just concentrate on them, they could concentrate on me, rather than trying to do this all-skate crazy thing. <clears throat> and then I would say, again, just reinvent. What can you, uh, using a lot of tech from the pandemic, I've now incorporated into my curriculum, for example, I used to get a lot of things in writing. <clears throat> and now, excuse me, I've shifted to videos where uh, a student will make a video entry of the same assignment rather than the writing. It's easier for them. I really get a sense of their expression. I really get a sense of, you know, they don't have to try to put all that thought in word. They can just talk and feel and connect. And I feel like that, instead of being tech fatigue, I mean, it is a lot to kind of hash through the videos, but I also personally get to know the students a lot more than receiving and writing and not really having a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. I have so much more one-on-one -on -one time with these individual submissions that I find incredibly powerful, and they get my feedback one-on-one -on -one throughout the entire course. So we get to know each other in the room as well as online through mm -hmm. these assignments. Um, and I understand the tech fatigue, but again, if you think out of the box, how can you accomplish the same amount of hours and go between some group stuff and individual stuff within your curriculum? Well, you're pretty much saying that if you do tech like we do education, traditional education, you're gonna get fatigue. Yes. But if you do tech with creativity, innovation, and hands-on experience, then you're gonna to want to use the tools that tech has for us. And again, we are so visual right now. If you know that, that's how people learn. That's how people absorb material. Use that as money in your pocket to create your curriculum around that framework. And I think you're gonna find a lot of invention and opportunity. Nice, go ahead, Tracy. I'd like to jump on that also, because I, I come from also a health background, I'm a, a, a physical, therapist, basically. But when you come to fatigue, a lot of times that fatigue is decision making. Mm -hmm. You know, they call it decision fatigue. Einstein, he had seven suits. They were all the same because that was just one decision he didn't have to make. <laughs> and, you know, with all this tech stuff and all this learning stuff and all these things that people are trying to implement, you know, one of the great solutions that you could do is give teachers a few more breaks. I mean, that would just be a real easy, you know, here's a space to breathe throughout the day. I've got a lot of teacher friends, and they say there's times that they don't even have a time to go for a bio break, you know? They don't have time to go to the bathroom. And it's like, that's terrible. You know, build in, if you can build in the curriculum, just a time for people to just be and breathe. They've taken recess. They've taken a lot of things out of the school, which are imperative right. for growth and understanding and creativity. Well, I, I think Robert said this earlier to me um, this week. She said that you experience where teachers move from classroom to classroom to teach 
the students. But at the same time, what we want to create for teachers, we want to create for students. So the movement is important, as well as the specialized or the choice or the creativity that we're, we're speaking about. So let's do one more. We're doing great. So personal goals, um, mission of the institution. So whew, this one is a hard one for me because um, we are in an institution um, when we talk about education at a large level and even going to a uh, community level. So how can, how do we support our teachers' personal goals and their needs from an institution perspective? i just say real quick, because I know I want to give everybody else a chance. One of the things we do at Polk Institute is, I know that in, my, in the class that I teach, the first thing that we talk about is what do you want? Mm -hmm. What, as you as a human being, what are your needs and what are your goals? Because uh, until we know that, we can't even get into, does this mesh with the mission of the Institute? Mm -hmm. And the Institutes, you know, we're talking about a broken system, right? We, we need Institutes where they're willing to say, you know what? Maybe we need to be more focused on the teachers and the people because they'll take care of the kids. How about we really teach and understand what the teachers are looking for, what their goals are, and how can we bring the institution around to do that, yeah. to, to, to help those? Yeah, I just want to touch a little bit on the social-emotional trend that we're going through. Um, and it's, it's killing me because um, we're telling teachers to teach social and emotional skills to our children and by being empathetic, by listening to them, by building relationships, but they're not getting it. So, um, and, and I just wanna plug in my, my dissertation was on the correlation between the perceived stress and emotional intelligence. So our teachers are struggling with emotional intelligence. So they, they have stress, they have higher stress and the more, lack of relationship they have from their institution, the more stress they perceive to have. Can there be, um, you know, they, we have this uh, at the university, we have um, a faculty senate, we have different sort of inter-institutional bodies where you can kind of voice those things. And I think that um, having kind of a platform and an ear where that can be possible, I think is very useful. And in addition, I would say, um, just creating even a weekly, fun, you know, social moment where like for a half hour, we all could be a potluck, whatever. We just have a powwow. So again, you're creating a social situation that's also uh, uh, casual, uh, emotional, fun, and we can strategically hit a question or two or what are your challenges this week? I think just people need to be heard. Mm -hmm. Students need to be heard. There's a lot of concentration on that, but teachers absolutely need to be heard. And how can we do that? I mean, one thing I'd like to pitch to you and to say like, what kind of freaks me out and I'm grateful not to be a victim of this in all my work, but the whole sort of um, uh, uh, various state like book banning and things like that. Like how do you still teach this important thing with all this stuff, material being pulled out from under you? So I would say like, what's the boil, again, boiling it down, headlining, what is the catcher in the rye about? What is this book about? And then how can you map that out onto something that's a current event right now? Sadly, you're not gonna read that amazing work, but you could still learn the thematic bottom line and have it be recontextualized to the students so they're learning where they're seeing that and realizing it in the, in the room and in their lives right now. And that's really what you're taking away with you. That's what, how that book lives in your heart. So maybe that's a way around it, but I'm, I don't know if that's even possible, but I hope it is. Okay, so is. I would like to uh, add something to that. Um, but before that, I would like to say that I really appreciate information that you did mention that we need, um, we need to know what they want, right? So um, here's the thing. When we try to run organization to be successful, we always have to focus on the employee. And for educational organization, we know that the key is about the teacher, right? So since we understand that it's all about their motivation to do the good job, 
And as a, a, a top leader, we want them to have a high performance and all the time. So to do that, we need to focus on individual needs. Like I did mention earlier that each of us has different needs. So we need those information. And I remember you did mention that sometimes we could do it weekly, monthly. I would say that we do it annually. Mm -hmm. So this is a part of HR job. OK, um, we can do this. We are HR functions. HR has responsibility to do many things about taking care of the, the employees. And they could be more creative when it comes to how to take care or support employee better. The goal is how we're going to make them have a high performance and for the long run. So because of that, the head of HR has to be strategic leader. Mm -hmm have to be a strategic leader, has to focus on future. Strategy is all about future. So how we gonna make our employee has a high motivation and work well. It's gonna relate to many things, even about the support, about well-being. Uh, from my previous research, uh, I had a chance to interview um, the Chief of Human Resource Management at University of Laval, both private university and public university, um, I found something that's very interesting. From the findings, there was the lack of on-site mental health program. Mm -hmm. You said it all right there. Yes, <laughs> so they are trying to have this. Mm. They are trying to have this, but still in the process. They recognize that stress issue, burnout issue, is really important for the employee, especially females, mm -hmm. because they have the role at home and the role at work. Yeah. They have the place that employee could call, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. So one of the chief of human officers said that, he would prefer to have on-site support. It means that could be um, professional persons right there at the school or, or at the university. So this is the new, um, the new, pretty much the new knowledge. Yeah. And the thing that uh, I think educational organization should really pay attention because it will really to uh, the well-being of uh, the employees. Yeah, I would like to hear if Robert got something. Uh... Well, to answer your question directly, on January 4th, I'm going into a 97-student public school just near where I live in Hawaii. Principal's been there for eight years and wants to make change in the school, mm -hmm. but doesn't feel the mission is giving her the license to do that. So the first thing we're going to do is work with the faculty on shifting the mission to something that everybody knows, recognizes, mm. and believes in. They stand behind. And I've been working with a lot of schools recently on creating just three word missions and a phrase for their vision. Uh, in one of my schools, our mission was connect, inspire, challenge. That was the mission. We based our teacher growth program on that. The way we design curriculum and program on connect, inspire, challenge. And everyone in that school knew the mission and vision of the school. So that's what we're going to do first. We're going to create a mission that everybody knows, everybody believes in, and everybody supports. And then we're going to start coaching every teacher around how do they bring that mission alive mm -hmm. into the school. And again, with all due respect to teachers, one of the things we need to focus on today is student voice. Mm student agency and student voice. So if your mission was connect, inspire, challenge, I would have something like you have in the restrooms in Singapore when you leave. It's a little screen where you push a smiley face, a neutral face, and an unhappy face. And I'd like the students to understand that when they left that room, they could punch one of those buttons to say, I felt connected, inspired, and challenged. Yeah. Powerful. And you got that teacher had that immediate feedback that their students understood the mission too, yes. and they believed that 
everyone at the school was living the mission. That's very powerful, very powerful. And you know, um, these experts are really clear that there are strategies and tools that exist today to support teacher motivation and retention. We would like to have a conversation with you though. We have enough time to have a dialogue with the audience about this topic. So even if it's not directly in our questions, but you want to make a statement on how to, not only a statement, but give us some suggestions on how we could retain and motivate our teachers, come on to the mic. Yay. Yes. Um, so I just walked away from two decades of tenure three days ago. Congratulations. Um, thank you. <laughs> and um, manifold reasons, but the question that I have for you is that I'm neurodiverse. Mm -hmm. And I um, find academia to be largely extroverted. And it has been a continual struggle for me to feel at home in an extroverted environment. What feedback would you give a student teacher who is an introvert or on the spectrum? Thank you. Mm. Mm. Well, one of the things that we invested in in one of my schools was the Gallup Clifton Strengths Finder. And every single person in that school went through the survey, which takes about 45 minutes to get your top five strengths. And they began to realize that we are all different, <laughs> funny enough, and that there are four domains, executing, influencing, relation building, and strategic. And not everyone, we talk about empathy. Empathy is a relation building strength. Yes. And if you have empathy as number 30, it's very hard for you to become empathetic. Uh, we say we can teach empathy. I'm not so sure. So if when once we know who we are and what drives us, and we have a school that is playing, building, and supporting our strengths, and we have administrators that understand about our people's strengths, you can take somebody who is introverted and show them their superpowers and where they can thrive and understand that we are all different in so many different ways, that we celebrate our differences, play to our differences, instead of spending so much time talking about our weaknesses. In strengths, the word weakness does not exist. I would have to agree with that wholeheartedly, because bottom line, we're, we're, it's almost frowned upon in society now to reflect. Hmm. to look inside and look at yourself because everybody's like, oh, that's so selfish. It's not. The greatest gift that we can give to each other is understanding who we are. Because when we know who we are, we know what our strengths are, and whether it's taking a survey or whatever it is, find your strengths, work in your strengths, and find those that complement them. But it's not a selfish thing to take care of yourself. It's not a selfish thing to take time to look in and see who you are and what you want. What, what I want or what do I want is not a selfish question. It is the greatest gift that we can give to each other. That's awesome. I just would like to add to that a little bit. I see it as um, the way people work together as a team. Um, I have taught the class called uh, Team Building and Group Behaviors for several years. One thing that I found out is um, it is the best to have everyone contribute that expertise when it comes to working together as a team. So that's how it works. Mm -hmm. It means that we know our strength, right? Mm -hmm. So if we could celebrate the strength like uh, you just mentioned earlier, and we would have the expertise from everyone. So finally, we will have a great outcome. It's great productivity from our team. Yeah. And that's a high job performance for our organization. I it's a win-win it. yeah. situation. I want to give the audience another opportunity. I want to hear some more. Come on. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you were able to change your evaluation system to a teacher growth system. Because I'm a firm believer it needs to be more about growth and support and development um, and in New York State, in the mm. Northeast, having worked in 
Rhode Island and Connecticut and New York. Um, we have state systems that are very, um, they require you to turn in your scores. Mm -hmm. And they require you to have your student scores. And um, so I'm just curious of like, way, I, I always believe there's ways to get around things. Yes. So I'm curious your strategy around how you turn that into more of a, a growth thing and how you got around having to like turn in scores or how you translate things into a score to kind of game the system a little bit. Yeah, well, I, love, I love Tracy <laughs> mentioned about the bottom up approach. So I'm not sure if Tracy, if you want to address that. Well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm ex-military, right? So you always have the higher ups saying, you got to do this, but the people on the ground are the ones that see what's going on. Absolutely. They know what's happening with the students. They know what's happening in the classroom. They know what's working and they know what's not working. And it's it to me, and I'm going to defer to Robert as well, but it seems to me, and maybe it's just me, but maybe the people that are on the ground might want to advise the people that are advising the people on the ground. And but it oh, comes back. <laughs> I'm sure you do. But I've it, been at the table at the top yeah. and advised them at the top, and right. they still don't listen. Well, and and therein lies the problem. The system's broken because it's trying to come from the top down. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. I'll be happy to talk with you afterwards. But we spent a whole year. I had a group of teachers, administrators, and myself design the system. We beta tested it with those teachers. Then they gave us the feedback how it felt. So that when we launched it, we had a group of teachers standing up with administrators saying, we support this system, it's going to work. And we gave the administrators and the teachers made promises. And so I have it all done. I can show it to you. It's all beautifully prepared for you to implement. All right, we'll connect later. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. So Excuse me. we are fulfilling uh, our goal. Uh, something just came across my mind. Please let me say really quick. Um, actually, I think we could do something really creative. Uh, we are thinking about making changes. We are thinking about the future. So future is all about strategy. So to do that, we have to have brainstorming. It's just like how organization create strategy to use for the next five years. So the new trend of creating strategy we call open strategy. Mm -hmm. It means that we bring our um, uh, stakeholders together and then ask them what they want, what they know, how they would uh, like to see uh, organization in the future. So in this case, it means we're going to ask them how we're going to evaluate the teacher yes. in the future. Thank you. So, you know, um, there's a lot of strategy speaking and tools, but it takes courage. It takes one person to decide that they're gonna make change in their institution. And, you know, we thank you for, and thank our panel. Let's give them a hand. Weren't they awesome? And I, wanna, I want you to walk away with what steps are you gonna take to support in the motivation and retention of our teachers. Thank you.